Welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. If some days you doubt yourself and you don't know what you're doing, if you've ugly cried alone in your bedroom because you felt like you're failing, well, I just want you to know you're not alone and you have come to the right place. Raising tweens and teens in today's world is not easy. And I'm on a mission to equip you to love well and to raise emotionally healthy, happy tweens and teens that thrive. I believe that moms are heroes and we have the power to transform our family and to impact future generations. If you are looking for answers, encouragement, and to become more of the mom and the woman that you want to be, welcome. I'm Cheryl Gould, and I am so glad that you're here. Hi, friend. Welcome to the podcast today. And if you have a tween or teen and you're frustrated because they're not getting enough sleep, you're going to want to listen to this podcast episode. My special guests are Heather Turgeon and Julie Wright, and they are authors of the best-selling book, The Happy Sleeper, and they just released their latest book, Generation Sleepless. And they share with us what to do if you have a tween or teen that isn't getting enough sleep. How much sleep should they be getting? I don't know one parent or caregiver that feels like their teens are getting the sleep that they need. And they talk about why, what is getting in the way of our kids getting enough sleep. And just that alone in this interview was so helpful. We think we know, but just hearing what the research shows that they have done and how we can turn things around is super informative and helpful. And it's hard when they're a teenager and they want to stay up and they don't want to go to bed. So what do you do? Well, you are going to get some answers in this episode. So let's dive in. Well, Julie and Heather, welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're talking about some really important stuff today that parents are really struggling with right now, and that is sleep and getting our tweens and teens to sleep, especially coming out of this pandemic. And you both have written a book that's called Generation Sleepless. So we're going to dig into that. But first, I'm so curious for you to share how you met and came to write this book. And this is not your first book that you've written together. You wrote a sleep book for a, for parents and caregivers to help their babies to get to sleep. Mm-hmm. So I would love to hear a little bit of your back, you know, what you're up to, what you're doing and how you met. So sure. Heather, you want to go first? Sure. So, well, that is exactly how we met. Julie and I were working with new families. So families who have babies and little kids and we, we felt like there was something missing from the conversation around baby sleep. And so we wrote The Happy Sleeper to help parents reconcile these two kind of what seemed like polarizing camps in, in baby sleep, um, the sleep training and cry it out kind of idea versus attachment parenting and emotional attunement and responsiveness. We felt like these two polarized camps made no sense and parents felt like they had to sacrifice one for the other. And we wrote the happy sleeper to say, you can have excellent sleep and an excellent emotional attachment to your baby. And here's how. So um, that's how we met. And we wrote the happy sleeper um, a number of years ago. And so we've been working with families for, for many years on sleep. But what we started to notice from the research and in our clinical practice was just how teenagers are really the ones who are suffering the most. They're the ones who really need our help the most. It's in every research study that you look at about about sleep, teenagers are the most sleep deprived population ever in human history. So they're the most sleep deprived of all of us. 
babies, little kids get generally get good sleep. About 60% of adults get good sleep, but only about 10% of teenagers get healthy sleep. So it's an absolute drop off and a complete crisis that hits, you know, in high school, starts in middle school, hits in high school really hard. And we wrote Generation Sleepless to say, this is a major crisis and we need to fix it. And we all need to come together to do that. Wow. And so you were both at the same practice and that's how you, how you met. Therapy practice. We weren't in the same practice, but we worked in the same fields and our paths over, over, you know, overlapped. And once the first time we met, we couldn't stop talking and we realized how, how much we thought alike and how much we both felt there was something missing from the discussion about sleep. So whether you're talking about babies, little kids, or teenagers, our starting point with sleep is that sleep is natural. We're all born with the ability to sleep well. It's very hardwired into our brains. And um, that's sort of part of our message also to parents of little kids and babies. But with teenagers, it's the same thing. When you take teenagers out on camp researchers take them on camping trips where they eliminate, you know, artificial light and technology and all these other, you know, activities and homework. And they find that um, after they make up for lost sleep by sleeping about 12 hours a night, they settle in at about nine and a quarter. So that that's what sleep scientists have identified as the sweet spot for teenage sleep. When in reality, like Heather said, um, you know, just they're, they're just vastly underslept. Most teenagers, most high schoolers are getting closer to about six hours of sleep by the time they're seniors. So their sleep loss is, is really devastating. Sleep loss for teenagers has been on the decline for decades, but the advent of technology took it on a nosedive. And like you're mentioning, the pandemic really wreaked havoc also with teenagers sleep. So We describe in Generation Sleepless, we describe a perfect storm of factors that that steal teenagers' sleep. So um, the first one is just a natural delay in their sleep clock. Their sleep clock is just naturally delayed. Their melatonin and their sleepiness hormones rise later in the evening, so they're just not tired as early as they used to be, up to about two hours, which means their bodies want to sleep that much longer in the morning to get the sleep that they need. So that's the first factor. Then you have just an, just a ridiculous amount of homework and activities that teenagers have or feel pressured to do, whether it's to show up on their college app or to, um, you know, just the amount of homework they have to do takes them way into the evening. A lot of times they don't even get home until six or seven at night And then when you, so they've got the natural delay, the homework, the activities, and then you've got technology and technology takes this, this and runs with it and takes them even hours later into the night. So their sleep, their bedtimes have gotten later and later and later. I mean, I never did four or five hours of homework when I was in high school, not even close. But then on the other end of their night, we have two early school start times squeezing their sleep from the other end which just gives you this mathematically impossible situation where they just literally don't have enough time to get the sleep that they need. Wow. You know, and for our listeners, so many of you I know are struggling with getting your kids out of bed. So to be able to have that understanding and empathy that this is tough because they're even their biological clocks aren't waking them up. I know our school um, has a late start now. Oh, good. And what time is it? I think they start now. My kids are out of high school, but I think it started at either nine or nine thirty. Oh, that's great. And yeah, and that's one of the best we've heard. Yeah, and um, we're from north of Chicago, and I think a lot of schools there are starting to do that. Mm-hmm. And I think it was two. It was maybe Tuesday or Thursday, or might have been Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And Mm. so even the ways that they change their class, the length of their class time in order to do that, uh, they've been getting creative. Do you see that more schools are doing that now? 
Some schools are definitely more schools. I mean, unfortunately, it's been a slow build because um, organizations like Start School Later and different different um, groups that have been trying to raise you know awareness about this have been really working on this for like twenty years to say, hey, the sleep science is really showing us that teenagers biologically go to bed later and sleep later in the morning. The morning hours contain a lot of dream sleep or REM sleep, which is really important for emotional processing and learning and memory. So if you shave off those two hours in the morning and you expect, you know, a 16 year old to get up at 6 a.m. knowing that they need two more hours of REM sleep, you're basically depriving them of basic, it's kind of like their overnight therapy. So they're not getting the emotional processing that they need and their memory is impacted by those two hours. So that's been very clear from the science for a long time. And it's still really, it's, it's slow going to get high schools to hear that and to really make changes. So a lot of states, well, I don't know about a lot of states, some states are considering doing it as a statewide legislation. So in California, starting this fall, high schools will not be able to start before 830, which is huge. I mean, for all high schools in California to make that shift is a huge public health initiative. So other states are considering it as well. Wow. So it makes a lot of sense to me that this is a a problem because like you mentioned, I think it was you, Julie, that mentioned how there's, you know, their, their homework load. They have more of a homework load Then you've got technology and they're on their technology and they're trying to connect with their friends and they've got FOMO and all of that. I even notice when I go to bed that I'm tempted to look at my phone just to, to unwind, like to kind of just, but it has the opposite effect. And so even last night, I was so tempted to look at I'm like, no, do not, do not look at your phone. You know, it affects my sleep. And so I can see for our kids, it becomes a habit too, that they're looking at their phones. Yeah. Well, it's a habit. It's also extremely addicting. I mean, that's why it's, I think it's more than a habit. And I think, I don't know if you've heard about the recent, um, the European Union is is enacting what they're it's a it's kind of they call it it's sort of a dry title. It's called the Digital Services Act. But what it's designed to do is something that we would wish for so much in this country, which is asking technology companies to show their algorithms, to show what they're doing, to to create more responsible design, to be more transparent so that they can be regulated the way the Food and Drug Administration regulates our food and our drugs. So we're just pouring content out into you know, the atmosphere and children are consuming it without any regulation. And it, it's like, I feel like it's like we're all part of a big experiment you know, and nobody asked for this and we're all feeling it. Everyone feels the pull of technology and it's very insidious. And it is really especially alluring to teenagers who by the end of being in school, being in activities, doing homework, they haven't had enough time to connect with their friends, to be social, to just hang out and be silly or or chat, you know, all of those things that everybody needs. So it makes sense that they want to go on their devices or just spaz out and play video games for a while. I mean, we all need downtime, but we'd much rather they have downtime with their friends outside after school, face to face, running around, you know, hanging out and not Um, studies show that the, the time they spend on their devices trying to connect socially is not nearly as positive as if they were to get that social connection and even connection within their families in other ways in more, you know, face-to-face kind of ways. So yeah, technology is, is a big part of the problem. In the book, we write a lot about how to change habits, how to set up new rituals and routines within the home, because it does take a lot of attention and a lot of working together and a lot of really listening to your teenagers and helping them become self-motivated to make these changes. It's, it's, 
it's not an easy thing to do, but we find that teenagers really like to learn about their brains and their bodies, and they like to learn about sleep. As long as you don't come at them in a, I mean, you know, this, you know, telling them what to do and what's good for them kind of way, you know, if you really listen to what they care about, you can almost always find a way in that relates to sleep. Yeah, well, I want to dig into that. But first, I just want to briefly talk a little bit more about what you were talking about, Heather, with the cost of this, not not to freak everybody out that's listening, because it does elicit some fear, like, oh, my gosh, but you were mentioning that they're not getting that what's it called REM, REM sleep Mm -hmm. in the, in the morning. Mm -hmm. So then it's affecting their brains. What Mm -hmm. else are the studies showing? What are some of the signs that maybe parents can be looking for? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to know and the most kind of relevant to right now is that we hear a lot about the mental health crisis in teenagers. So more than one in three high schoolers reports feeling a persistent sense of sadness or helplessness. Um, you know, thoughts of self-harm are, are way up from 10 years ago. It's it's truly, um, it's disturbing and it's, you know, it tops every parent's concern list, I would say. And sleep and mental health are inextricably linked. So if teenagers are missing two hours of sleep every night, they are, you know, essentially doubling the risk for depression. So if you are concerned about your teenager's mental health, absolutely the number one step right now is to look at their sleep. And eight hours is what we would consider adequate sleep on a school night. So every night of the week, getting eight hours of sleep is what we consider adequate, but nine hours is actually optimal. Like Julie was saying, you know, if you really let teenagers sleep as much as they'd like, most will sleep more like nine or nine and a half. So looking at just the number, the hour, sometimes it's hard for parents because they go to bed before they're teenagers. So it's tricky, but um, counting the hours is actually the best way to figure it out. Um, So mental health goes down, risk of depression and thoughts of self-harm go way up when sleep deprivation is, when kids are sleep deprived. And that's because sleep deprivation changes the brain. It activates the more negative reactive centers of the brain and it kind of dulls down the frontal cortex. So we don't feel as much um, perspective or, or, you know, we lose our judgment. We don't have as much of a soothing, you know, sense from our, from our frontal cortex and our, instead our negative, you know, frustration, sadness, anger are way up. So you can see that in brain scans when people are sleep deprived. So, you know, when people feel like teens are grumpy or, you know, moody, I mean, it's no surprise when they're sleeping six or seven hours a night when they really need nine. Um, So I think mental health is kind of the number one thing that we see parents being concerned about with good reason. It makes so much sense. I mean, I even think when I'm not getting good sleep, how I'm, I act differently. You're just more, I'm more reactive, feel as good, more impatient. And you feel kind of pessimistic, like, like you don't know how things are going to go. They don't seem like they can work out. You don't have as much creative energy for, for, for problem solving. You just feel kind of more hopeless. Whereas when you sleep well, you feel like you've got the brain energy to figure it out and, and you feel more hopeful and more optimistic. Yeah. Julie, would you add anything to that? Well, yes, I was thinking it makes sense also because what happens is relationships suffer. When we're feeling that way, it's hard to have good relationships. It's hard to interpret the things people say in a positive light. It's hard to make sense of of things. So we see relationships suffer not only with friends, but also within the family. And, you know, as parents, we all know what it's like to try to have a conversation with an exhausted teenager. So relationships suffer. The other things we see with sleep deprivation are um, more poor decision making and risk taking, more accidents, more car crashes, 
more substance abuse. I mean, it's every, it's literally the list of things that parents worry about are negatively affected by, by not getting enough sleep. It seems like we're not talking about this enough. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. We agree. Yeah. That's, why we, that's, why, we that's we, why we need your book. We couldn't not write this book is how we felt. We just felt mm-hmm. like it was the missing link to so mm-hmm. many issues mm-hmm. and not being thought about, not being prioritized. People just, you know, they worry about so many things and we understand that they worry about their kids' happiness and their mental health. And are they going to get into a good college and are they okay with their friends? But it's, it's, it's almost like people just forgot about sleep. Sleep got pushed to the way to the bottom of the list. And I think a lot of people just think teenagers are like, not only like mini adults, but even more resilient maybe than adults. Like they could even get by on less sleep than an adult. You know, I think people just don't really understand how important sleep is. And, you know, we haven't even talked about this yet, but teenagers' brains are undergoing a massive period, a very distinct and massive period of restructuring and remodeling, which again, I think a lot of people don't realize that this this is a really transformative time. It's very similar to the time we worry and so much about their sleep with, you know, the zero to three years when so much is going on with brain development. And it's a similar period for teenagers. So there, there are just a million reasons why sleep should be a priority. Heather and I often say, think of sleep as foundational to your to your being alive, like air and water and food and sleep. Because in reality, if we don't sleep, eventually we will die. Most of us don't get to that point, but sleep is is foundational to every aspect of our health, both physical and mental. Wow. And it seems like it's like we're, we're treating the symptom, but we're not getting to the root cause. Like even with and I'm not against medication, you know, but things may just crap themselves is what I'm hearing you say with them getting more sleep. It's well, really true. That first. Yeah. 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 Which leads me, I want to share a question and it's funny that this just came in and uh, the other day when they have, this is a mom asking me a question when they have so much homework and a sport that is every day. How do we get them to get the sleep they need? It is all too much. It feels like something is going to break. Everyone is pushing themselves too hard. And so her question is, what do I do to get my kid to go to bed and get the sleep they need when they've got all this homework, they're playing a sport? Um, What what would you say a few of the things that they can begin to implement in their homes? Well, so I think that the 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 way to look at it from a a bigger perspective is that that perfect storm that Julie was talking about, because the homework and the activities and the technology all play into it. And then you've got um, some more practical things that parents can do at home. So we we basically like to spread the responsibility out. We don't want parents to feel like this is all on them and they have to fix it. Mm. So we, that's why we do presentations for high schools and why we talk to sports coaches and why there's a lot of information in the book about, you know, how LeBron James uses sleep to increase his, his sports performance. Like sleep is, is important to athletic performance and sleep loss is the number one predictor of sports injury. So if you have an athlete who's a high, a high school athlete and their coach is not talking about sleep, their coach is missing some information. So that's where we, the generation sleepless is not just about making parents get their kids to bed. It's about calling everybody out on their role in in not allowing teenagers healthy sleep. So I would say, you know, if you're a sports coach or a PE coach or, you know, a club coach, you know, you, you have a responsibility for making sleep a priority and talking to your athletes about that. And, you know, I've, I, I, we have, there's swim, swim meets that start at 6am, right? So there's something really wrong with, with that 
because it doesn't actually work for their athletic performance. So um, I think that's part of it is that we have to spread their responsibility out. We have to talk to high schools about limiting homework, but also teens do tend to procrastinate because of their technology. So what feels like three hours of homework sometimes can be, oh, wait a minute, we have to talk about healthy boundaries with technology because you've got your phone in your room while you're trying to do a paper and then your friend's texting you and then you're not really focused. So there's healthy, you know, there's, there's good boundaries around time management and study habits. And then we've got the routines that you need to actually allow your sleep chemistry to, to unfold. So you, you want to look at a wind down routine in generation sleepless. We have wind down routine, bedtime routine and morning routine, and they're actually all super important. They create what we call the sleep bubble. So you want to have a wind down, you want to have a bedtime routine, and you also want to have a morning routine. And on the weekends, you want to get up within an hour or two maximum of the time you get up during the week. This is something that parents can look at to help teenagers fall asleep more easily during the week. You want to get them up within one to two hours on Saturday and Sunday from when they have to get up during the week and get sunshine at that time, or just be outside, even sun through the clouds. So I think for a parent who's understandably like, what do I do about this? It has to be a holistic, you know, you kind of want to look at it holistically, but um, the things you can do immediately in your home are set those three routines up and talk to your teen about it, you know, get their buy-in to work on what time they wake up in the morning on the weekends and talk about technology boundaries, because that is one of the number one things that's keeping them up is, you know, most of them have their phones in their room. A lot of them actually have their phones on their pillow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What time should they hand in their phones? Do you think <laughs> I get that one a lot? <laughs> Well, one of the things Heather and I say is, you know, if you have a a younger teen, like a tween or a middle schooler, you know, don't let go of those rules and those boundaries, whether, you know, maybe you're, you know, it all depends on what time they have to wake up in the morning. But let's say your, you know, 14 year old has to, you know, be in bed by 10 o'clock to get would that work nine hours? That's what time my 14 year old gets in bed. (laughs) I mean, he gets in bed at 930, but. He gets in bed at 9.30, turns out the light at, at 10, but he has to put his phone away at eight. But that's, that's to me. I mean, that, so that's two hours before his bedtime is when he puts his phone away and he doesn't have, so that's the two hour buffer. And then he gets into, then he has a bedtime routine. That's like a half hour long or so he reads and then he shuts off the light at 10 and he has to wake up around seven. How nice that he reads. You know, mm-hmm. my kids aren't reading anymore no. because of the phone too. Mm-hmm. Well, Heather, how did you get him to do that? Of course, you're a sleep consultant and um, psychotherapist. So I'm sure that he, <laughs> you started this early on, but parents get a lot of pushback. Yeah. And so they, yeah. and a lot of fighting and working with parents myself, you know, I'm, I'm hearing that. Well, I keep telling them they have to hand it in and then they're resisting me and they don't want to hand it in. And it gets, you know, I'm always going and knocking on their door. You're supposed to hand it in by nine 30 and you're not. And yeah. Um, or I need my alarm clock you know, mm-hmm. for the yep. morning where I like to listen to music to wind down. So yeah, there's so many, you're, you're naming all the ones that we, that that's exactly all the, all the things I think. Um, well, my son has never not known this is a way of life. So that's, that's where we say to like, if you have an elementary schooler, don't ever let it be a thing that you start doing where they have their phone in their room, you know, just keep, keep what you think are extra, you know, um, extra, just, just do more than you think you need to do because it's hard to rein them back. It's hard to get back to those healthy habits once you've let go. Um, but it's not that it's not possible. I would say that when you have a wind down routine that doesn't involve screens, the way to think about it is not just getting rid of your screens, but, but what are you adding that is fun? Because it doesn't mean that we can't have fun or we can't do things we enjoy before bed. So think about if we put our phones away, but the whole family watches a movie or watches a TV show, um, 
or, you know, does something that everybody enjoys, just walk the dog or um, play cards, like do something that's actually enjoyable. And you can watch a movie together in the living room. Um, if you make it a draw to come out of your room and do something with a family and let your phones go, then it's better than just saying like, you can't be on your devices and just trying to take them away. So just think about adding some fun things to do during the wind down time. Um, oh, yeah, I love that rather than just trying to take it away. Exactly. Be able to replace it with something positive. Yeah. And that really depends on what your kids are into. I mean, uh, you could do charades. You could, I mean, the easiest thing is just to watch a TV show. So find one that you all like, find some kind of like reality show. That's fun. Like, you know, find something the whole family is into and just make it, a, make that a priority and put the phones away before that. So that there's something fun to come to. Yeah. Love that. Julie, do you have any, any other thoughts that you'd like to add? Yeah. Well, everything that Heather said is, is really helpful. I, I think when we, we work with families, we also, we hear from teenagers that their parents are on their phones all the time. And we hear from families that parents kind of give up. And so they go into their room and they get on their device and their teenagers in the other room and everybody's kind of off in their own separate corner. So we find it's really helpful to talk honestly with your teenager about your own technology use and your own sleep. And if you can do that and come to some, you know, realizations that things that you want to change about your own sleep as a parent, then you can work with your teenager and say, listen, I'm going to park my device at 930, you know, let's all, you know, let's all park our devices and then let's do, let's create some new rituals. Let's, you know, do something fun or everybody can have time to read. Even if, if people don't want to come together, I mean, everybody's going to want to do different things sometimes, but um, I think parents model the use of technology and they also model poor sleep habits often. And I think it helps a lot to talk about sleep as a family. We even put forward in the last chapter of the book, a, a sleep challenge, so a family can take the challenge of, you know, a group of friends or a sports team or a theater group or whatever can take the sleep challenge. And it can be fun to kind of take the challenge and then check back in after a week or two and see how everybody did and how they're feeling. So I think it's like it's like with any really addictive habit, it's hard at first to change. But if you stick to it long enough, now you're creating a new habit a new, healthier, more desired habit. And we can do that. We can change our habits. And um, we also like to talk to teenagers about big tech and how they don't have teenagers' best interests at heart and give them that feeling like you're getting the behind the scenes idea here of these companies, all they want is your money and your attention, and they don't care about you. So talking to them in a way of sort of helping them feel like they have a little bit of an inside scoop on what's going on here. I think some teenagers really like that angle too, and feeling like, hey, I want to control my technology. I don't want it to control my life, you know? Yeah. Social dilemma is a good is a good movie to watch together. Gosh, that was powerful. Yeah. 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 Just seeing how it's all working behind the scenes to create that addictive, mm -hmm. just that addiction to your phone and to, yeah, suck you, suck you into it. I mean, imagine sending your kid to bed with a, like a tray of beer and a pile of, you know, I don't know, weed or something. I mean, you just wouldn't send your kid to bed with a bunch of substance, you know, addicting things, you know, you also wouldn't give them a big old mug of coffee, you know, at bedtime, but technology is, is really something that we, we just haven't really linked it as as we should to something that should be dealt with in a very, you know, treated with a lot of um, what's the word for it. We want to be judicious about it and really thoughtful and use it in a really informed way. It's, we don't want to demonize it. We're not going to get rid of it, but we want to be in control of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love um, 
including yourself in the process, like modeling, because that is true. Like have your kid handed in at nine, but you're on your phone, you know, <laughs> and saying, let's all see. Yeah, I had the sleep challenge. I love that idea. And then talking about how differently you feel like that was what kept me off my phone last night. And I'm like, I feel so much better when I get good sleep. Yeah. Like my brain, everything works better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus you can't fall asleep if you've just been on your device, Yeah, yeah. the light, the activation and the, and the engagement, which creates a state of flow. All of those things make it very difficult to then just lie down in bed and expect to be able to fall asleep. Yeah. Well, any, any, um, closing words, I really think, I mean, you're making me feel so passionate about this, just with the connections of how important sleep is and like giving them beer or weed before they go to bed. I mean, in a way that's, that is, it's going to affect them. And yet we don't think about sleep in the same way. So very powerful um, to think about. And in your book, you share a lot of ideas, how to create that connection because we're so isolated. So I, I really want to recommend to our listeners to get your book and how to engage and talk about these things, because we do need help and how to have these important conversations and those positive things that we can, that we can replace the technology with. So they want to, they want to connect, they want to be with, with us and, and engaging more in the positive. So mm -hmm. I love that. Any parting words? Parting words. I think, I mean, we just, we, we would love for people to get the book, to talk about the book, to share it with people, you know, who are in their high school and on their sports teams and in their communities and not just think of this like a parenting book or, you know, because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of really cool stuff about the teenage brain in this book. It's really looking at this from a lot of different angles and, at the same time, Julie and I cannot help ourselves from being very practical and very user-friendly. So <laughs> the book, almost every other page has a takeaway or a, a little, you know, a tip or something that you can actually use. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just check out the book. And our, our website is thehappysleeper.com. That's our first book about babies and little kids, The Happy Sleeper. And they can find it there. Yes. And anywhere, anywhere books are sold, but yes, our, our website is the happy sleeper. And that's your Facebook page as well. We actually don't really have a Facebook page, although, well, we sort of do, but we mostly use Instagram. Okay. Cause I think I found you on Facebook. And, okay. Well, that's good. Yeah, and you, um, and you had posted like, because I saw happy sleeper, but you just like post, you know, had a post. Oh, wonderful. Good day. Our, our Instagram posts automatically post on, oh, our, on our Facebook. Okay, <laughs> very good. Because I was like, oh, they have baby stuff here, you know, some things, but a lot of stuff for teenagers yeah. and about your book. That is why. Okay, and mostly on Instagram. Also, what are you doing? I mean, are you speaking to schools? Are you, I mean, this could be like, I, I'm imagining you're trying to bring about changes? Are you talking to schools or? We are, we are. We actually spoke to a group of students at Yale a few weeks ago. And that was just so, I mean, they were just, the students were so engaged and they were so thoughtful and they were so tired, you know, and it was, it was clear to us that this is definitely an issue for college students as well. Um, but yeah, we're speaking to several schools in the near future and we, we'd love to speak to more. Okay. Good to know, because we need that third party influence, you know, mm -hmm. like the coaches and talking to them about how to be able to share that with your kids. So it's not just coming from the parents that this, it, I always, yeah. when you were sharing, I was thinking, um, like moms against drunk drivers. That's yeah. what I was thinking this is like, where you're raising our awareness and our consciousness that this is really important stuff. So mm. thank you for what you're doing. Thank you yeah. so much. This was Dr great. Drowsy driving is very similar to drunk driving. Yeah. Too. You know, Heather and I, we, we say, you know, you wouldn't hand your keys to your teenager if you knew she'd been drinking, but, you know, we hand our keys to to tired, sleep-deprived teenagers all the time. Wow. So 
It is. I mean, Heather and I fantasize like a round table with big tech here, college admissions here, high schoolers here, state legislatures here, and just, you know, sitting down and saying, you know, we can't leave this room until we solve this. And it's, and I think another parting word is that the cool thing about this is that it's fixable. This is not a problem that we cannot solve. It's a solvable issue. That's yeah, good- I, I picture it. I think that, you know, you're bringing change and that's really very uh, encouraging. So I know a lot of our listeners are going to want to get that book and, and read it and be able to make these changes in their homes. So thank you for coming on and sharing, sharing with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. This was fun. Well, that's it for today. And thank you for joining me, friend. I love hearing from you and how you're finding this podcast helpful. And if you could take a moment and leave a review so we can get the word out, I would be so appreciative. We all need support. Those of us that are either raising tweens and teens or in the life of a tween and teen to be able to help them and give them what they need. And so I would so appreciate it if you would take a moment. And also, if you need more support, check out our website at momsoftweensandteens.com. You will find so many resources there to support you, and you can connect with me. If you have any questions, I do a weekly Facebook Live on our page. So that is where I answer your questions. So you can submit those to me and let me know that they are for my Facebook Live, and I will send you the link to the page if you don't know it so that you can watch there. So have a great week and thanks again for joining me and I will see you back here next time.